Whenever we have a new piece of music on our series, whenever possible, I like to have the composer himself here so that we can set the stage with a brief conversation in which we talk a little bit about what's behind the piece, the architecture of the piece to a degree, whatever it is that strikes you as interesting. To me, it's, it's clear already that this was written about your brother Jonathan, so I think that seems like the logical point of departure for this conversation. You could tell us a little bit about who he was and a little bit about your relationship. And early on, as we began to discuss this, he gave me this picture that was taken in 1966 <laughs> of the 14-year-old Jonathan and the 11-year-old Bruce. And I thought maybe it might be a, uh, a good jumping off point for you to tell us a little bit about your relationship and who he was. Yes, well that picture is the two of us performing a Mike Nichols and Elaine May routine. <laughs> My brother and I were obsessed with Nichols and May and we memorized all the recordings. In those days, of course, I, you, you had to have an LP. And my brother, being the older one, was always Elaine May. And I got to be Mike Nichols. Um, and there, we're sitting on a little piano in a hotel in the Adirondacks where we performed on Friday nights for actual audiences who somehow, they were not paying audiences. Because to see an 11-year-old and a 14-year-old doing Mike Nichols and Elaine May routines, I, I don't think you could get too many people to actually buy a ticket for that. But we did know them, we, we, we knew all of them. So that was part of our relationship. Uh, we were very into drama, our family was into theater and drama. Shakespeare was a normal part of our lives when we were kids. My father quoted Shakespeare at the drop of a hat and we're always throwing hats on the floor to get him to do it. Um, and so we also though found our paths right away. My brother found visual arts very young and I was doing music. Well, doing music very young is actually not unusual. Most for musicians, almost every musician who is a professional started extremely young. Uh, and in the visual arts, I think it's a little bit un more unusual. He was actually painting all day long, all the time, hmm. uh, from when he was maybe nine. And he had paints all over the house. In fact, you know, if maybe 15 years ago, I went back to the house on Long Island where we grew up, and I went into the basement uh, the people who lived there, I didn't know them, but I just told them I wanted to see the house and they, they were fine about it. And they said, we have a question for you. On the floor of the basement, which is all cement, there's this weird red, blue, green, black, crazy design. And it's in the floor. They said, what is that? I said, it's just leftover paints from my brother's work. Mm. It had become part of the foundation, basically. Now, from what he's told us and from what I know about their relationship, they collaborated throughout their lives on projects even more creative than doing Nichols and May routines. <laughs> That's true. Uh, well, one collaboration was, oh, look at that. Uh, this, is, this is one of them. This was a, an opera that Bruce wrote about 40 years ago for the 92nd Street. Wait a minute, Why? did you say 40 years ago? Well, uh, I think you're right. I think it is 40 years ago. Okay. Which is strange because... Uh, you know, you're only 35 and I'm only right. 39, but... That's uh, right. That was you in 1971. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was. That was. So, yes, this opera is from 1982, written for the 92nd Street Y in Manhattan. Uh, it's about Solomon McHoyles, who was a famous Yiddish actor who was murdered by Stalin's, on Stalin's orders. And uh, when he was, when McHoyles was uh, at his funeral, they cut his tongue out as a symbol of the end of Yiddish. Um, and my brother did the scenery, the set, and, and I wrote the music. And what he did for the set was kind of amazing, which was uh, instead of having scenery the way you would normally expect to see in a dramatic production, he built a tower that was based on a tower designed by the Russian constructivist artist Tatlin. And he built the tower so it looked exactly like what Tatlin had designed but was never built, and it turned. And each time it turned, there was a different location for the opera, which was still done in a kind of semi-abstract constructionist form. So it was a very, very um, Soviet set, quite remarkable. In fact, you see kind of what it looked like there. 
well, even though that's a drawing. So throughout your lives, you were collaborating both artistically and uh, in other ways? Um, well, we had lunch a lot. Had lunch a lot. Um, <laughs> yeah. um, no, we did collaborate occasionally. Um, and I think that over, the, over time, both of us moved away from theater. Uh, John studied stage design at NYU, which is where he met his wife, Adrian. Uh, and I was very interested in writing for the theater and did a lot of it. But then we both felt that the theater was not the most personal place for a composer or a visual artist because there are too many demands made by the director and this, everything else. So I moved away from writing for theater just to compose uh, music for musicians only. And he did this, sort of the same thing. He moved away from set design to be a painter and uh, when it used all kinds of extraordinary materials. In fact, he, he was really an, an, experiment, an experimenter and kind of an innovator in use, use of material. Um, and I, there, we, yeah, there he is in 2022. And behind him is one of his paintings, which I'm sure we'll get another look at. Um, yeah. That's an invisible altar. There he is in front of invisible paintings. I find this one haunting, this blurry picture of him walking across the gallery floor in the last year of his life and uh, yeah. in front of a uh, translucent triptych that he created. I, I think I'll leave it up there as a backdrop to our conversation about okay. memory believes. Yeah. Um, about six weeks ago, I received in the mail a score to this piece, which I assume you had sent to me. Yes. <laughs> and I was examining it, of course, rifling through it. And one of the first things that I noticed, of course, is its unusual orchestration. I don't think I know any other pieces for string quartet and chamber choir. And I think everybody will be interested in knowing how you arrived at that unusual scoring. Yeah, I mean, I think there are a lot of pieces that are performed that way if they weren't written that way. I mean, string ensemble and chorus. And if there is a piece for chamber choir and string quartet, I don't know it, but there may well be. Um, basically, when I was thinking of writing a requiem for my brother, I, wanted, I was wondering, what should it be for? I mean, an orchestral work seems to be a ridiculous idea. It's too public, it's too grand, it makes no sense, it's not intimate. And then I called Mark Steinberg, the first violinist of the Brentano Quartet, and we've known each other for many, many years. And I just said, if I made this requiem for a string quartet, do you think your quartet would be available? And he said, yes, immediately. So then I started writing it for quartet. If he had said no, I might have written it for some other kind of ensemble. Hmm. But I'm very close to the Brentano Quartet, and actually my brother was a huge fan of the Brentano as well. And so I... I knew there had to be a text, so then there had to be a choir. And the only choir that I've ever worked with is the Antioch. I've worked with them twice before because once I knew who they were and heard them, I really didn't have any desire to, you know, if I were in charge, to hire another choir. So mm -hmm. I, these are two of my absolute favorite ensembles in the world, and they, they're extraordinary together. Well, as you'll hear, it, it's, it's a mesmerizing combination and a mesmerizing piece. Um, and the architecture is interesting, too. As you see from your program booklets, it is in seven movements, and it alternates between solo medita meditations, uh, soliloquies for solo string instruments, and then the second, the fourth, and the sixth movements are for the entire ensemble together. And each of these was inspired by a different piece of poetry or a piece of prose poem. Uh, the first one, by Emily Dickinson begins, because I could not stop for death. And I wonder if you might tell us a little bit about why you selected this particular excerpt. Well, this is a very famous poem, and I hesitated to use it because it's so famous at first. But then, I could not stop for death it was exactly what I was looking for, because my brother in his last year, uh, I mean, he had pancreatic cancer, uh, he could have been someone who decided to do nothing or to just read or go, uh, retreat into himself. But actually, he did more painting than ever. He worked very, very hard. And the idea of not stopping for death was exactly who he was. And uh, what we're seeing here is a rotating gallery of paintings that he, or creations that he made during 
the last year of his life in 2022. And I'm, I've been looking at these for the last six weeks or so. I'm, I'm struck by so much about them. Uh, there is a, an exuberance in his choice of colors and, uh, and a humor in his choice of titles. And, and it all tells me that he, like you, must have been a, a very emotionally resilient person, in, particularly in light of the fact that he knew what was going on. Yes, yes. Well, I think it, in many ways his last year, at least for me, I think this was his most compelling work. And they're quite large. You can't tell from this, but they're very big. And in fact, uh, some museums in Europe were suddenly interested in him. And the, the paintings were too big to ship, so he had to make smaller versions or smaller paintings, which he did. They're still large, but they were able to be sent over there. Mm -hmm. I'll move into the poetry that inspired the fourth movement, this by Ethan Canaan, which is, Are There Not a Thousand Forms of Sorrow? which is actually a quote from a piece of prose. It's from the Doubter's Almanac, a Doubter's Almanac, which is right there. Um, I became interested in the writing of Ethan Canaan because of Serena Cannon, same spelling, her cousin. Now, Serena is the second violinist in the Brentano Quartet, and she told me that her cousin writes books years ago. So I started reading his books, and I ended up reading all of them. He has a new one coming out soon. But this book really spoke to me profoundly, and I invited him to Colorado to a festival I was running at the time, and I interviewed him, and I said, and I, I didn't know him at the time, and I still don't know him very well. Uh, I said to him, I love that spot near the end when suddenly you're not the narrator exactly, and you're not speaking as a character, but you're obviously speaking as yourself. And he said, I never do that. And I said, you sure? What about are there not a thousand forms of sorrow? Is the sorrow of death the same as the sorrow of knowing a pain in a child's future? He said, oh, that, right. Yeah, no, you're right. <laughs> and I what? thought that that was just something that he had to get into the book. Right. And it's, I've been obsessed with that, those two lines that he wrote. Well, as, as a matter of fact, you know, when he told me that one of the movements was going to be called Are There Not a Thousand Forms of Sorrow? It rang a bell, because I remembered that in 2017, I think, right. you wrote a piece for the Lincoln Center Chamber Music Society. Was that for a, a, a major anniversary of some sort? It was the 50th anniversary of the Chamber Music Society when, when it was performed. And it was called, Are There Not a Thousand Forms of Sorrow Also? And I actually, um, in, even though there was no singing, I took the line, Are There Not a Thousand Forms of Sorrow? And I set it to music. And, let and me, use that as the basis. Right, let me play that for you. Uh, and, and you can listen to it, and it will give you a lot of insight into what you're going to hear from about the fourth movement of this piece onward. interesting part about the other piece is that I just set the first line, are there not a thousand forms of sorrow? But that piece has no singing, and I, I let go of it, except for the phrase, and wrote a piece that was really not about uh, anything that has to do with this piece. It was a piece of more built on anger, actually, and, and rage, which is the perfect thing to do for the 50th anniversary of an organization you work for. <laughs> but, but anyway, it went, it went fine. And, but for this one, I, took, I felt like I needed to take that again, that same line, and the, and the line after it, and actually set the text, which I did. And then I let that melody, which obsesses me as much as the text now, to permeate most of this piece. Yeah, it, it really is the literal centerpiece of the composition. Yeah. It's the fourth movement in a seven-movement work, and it comes back and it's treated canonically. And the final choral movement, the sixth movement, is based on what we're looking at here, this line from William Faulkner's Light in August, Memory Believes Before Knowing Remembers, which is a very intriguing thought. And I know that you have, again, this fascination with the way that the mind works and the way that 
memory works. Was this an inspiration for your use of this? Well, it seems, in a way, it, it seems that Faulkner in this line and also several lines after, let's see if I remember, uh, memory believes before knowing remembers, believes longer than recollects, longer than knowing even wonders. Mm. And it's a very beautiful text that it's like music in that you understand it until you try to explain it, you know. Uh, but you can explain it because it's kind of like an, a cognitive al algorithm for how the brain uh, deals with memory and knowing and wondering, which are hard words to define. And um, the person I work with in neuroscience, you know, Antonio Damasio, uh, writes about knowing quite a lot, knowing versus feeling. The word feeling is not in there, but it might as well be. You know, be the feeling of wonder and knowing and memory. And since this piece is about memory, the expression that he, he came up with, memory believes, is so profound. Just those two words, it's extraordinary. But he also, my brother read all of the major authors of the 20th and early 21st century. Um, he was an obsessive reader and a buyer of first edition books and surrounded himself in an, a library of literature that was very intense. Most people, they would see it in a photograph and ask where he went to get that picture. Hmm. You know, but so yes, Faulkner was someone he knew very well, which is what brought me to Faulkner, not to that quote. I read quite a lot to find that quote. So I think that sort of sets the stage for us hearing this piece for yes. the first time. I think it's a good time for us to uh, sit back and, and hear it for the first time. So toy toy. Thank you, Michael. Thank you for the conversation. Thank you.